Grace, mercy and peace be with all of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. In our epistle reading for today from Romans chapter 8, the Holy Spirit says to us through the Apostle Paul that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is ours in Christ Jesus. And he then unpacks this from three different angles. In the first place, our sin cannot separate us from the love of God that is ours in Christ Jesus. And that means neither our sinful actions nor our sinful nature, which continues to hang around and give us problems. So why can't our sin separate us from the love of God? Because there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Right? So if you are a baptised believer, if you now live by faith in Jesus Christ as your saviour, then that means you now always live under the umbrella of God's forgiveness. And when he forgives us, he doesn't hold anything back. His forgiveness is total. He takes away all our guilt and all our shame and all the punishment and condemnation that we deserve. And he does this for all of our sins, past, present and future. It's not as if every time we stumble and fall because our sinful nature gets the better of us, that we slip out from underneath God's grace. No, instead, as long as we remain in Christ, we are always under the umbrella of his grace. Yes, it would be a different story if we were to turn our backs on him or reject him or think that we didn't need him or something like that. But as long as the Spirit of God leads us to live that Christian life, that life that's characterised by daily repentance and faith in our Lord, so that when our sin does get the better of us, better of us and we do slip and fall, what do we do? We, we say, oh God, thank you, <laughs> right, that I have forgiveness through you. Yeah, please forgive me once more and give me the help that I need to do better in the future. And he then gives us both the forgiveness and the help that we need. Right, so as long as we continue to live in that relationship that the Spirit of God has established between us and Jesus Christ, there is no condemnation for us. And this means that we don't have to worry that perhaps God is angry with us because of our sins, or perhaps he hates us or is planning to punish us. No, instead we can just remain secure in his love and if the devil or any other any any human being tries to accuse us or condemn us because of our sins we can say no nope, sorry you've got the wrong person you need to go and take that up with jesus christ i still remember the first time i ever went to private confession and absolution I had something on my conscience that I really wanted to get off my chest and I wanted to hear the good news proclaimed to me that that sin was forgiven. But at the same time, I was very fearful because this meant telling another person my sin. And I thought, oh, what if he then uses this against me? But you know what helped me to overcome this fear? It's this knowledge that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? So if I confessed my sin and had it absolved in the name of Jesus Christ, if anyone was to then have a go at me because of that sin and try and accuse me as a result of it, I could say, look, sorry, you've got the wrong person. You need to take that up with Jesus Christ because that sin's on him now, right? Because he has taken it for me. And because there is no condemnation for us when we are in Christ Jesus, what now counts in the sight of God is not our sin, but instead the work of his spirit in us. Yes, as we spoke about last week, that old Adam, the old sinful nature in us, continues to hang around until the day we die and continues to cause us trouble. And yes, it's true that we are very much works in progress. Right? You can compare a Christian to a, a Christian, at least in this world, in this life, to a building that's undergoing extensive renovations. Right? While the renovations are in progress, that building is likely to look like a mess. 
right? Maybe some sections have been nicely renovated, but there'll be still be sections that are in disrepair and there's likely to be building materials lying around and everything needs to be properly cleaned up, right? But the important thing is what's going on there, that work of restoration. So likewise, when you look at us Christians, yes, we're works in progress. Yes, our lives are often a mess because of our sins and failings. Yet nevertheless, right, our sins and failings don't need to rule us or define us. And they do not determine what we are in God's sight. Because all of this is covered by his grace. And what counts as far as he is concerned is what he is making us to be through his Holy Spirit. And this same Spirit of God who is working in us now testifies to us, both through his written word and also in the hearts of those who listen to this word, that we are now the beloved children of God. All right, so our sin cannot separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus and neither can our sufferings. Why not? Well, because our sufferings are not a sign that God hates us or has forgotten us. Right? It's true that many people, when they're suffering, think that this must be the case. They think, oh, God must have forgotten me. You know, surely this means that God doesn't love me anymore. Right, but nothing could be further than further from the truth. Right, the God's word tells us something different, which is that God actually has a special love for those who are afflicted. So our sufferings are not a sign that God's forgotten us or that he hates us, but instead they are a sign that his plans for our good are not yet complete. Right, as our text for today says, God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Right, so if we haven't yet seen the end good that God has in store for us, it's just because his plans are not yet complete. And what is his plan? His plan is to conform us to the image of his son. And this means that our lives are going to follow the same pattern as the life of Jesus Christ. Right, what happened in his life? Well, he underwent many sufferings and intense sufferings. But his sufferings then all came to an end. And where is he now? He's in glory that will last for all eternity. So likewise, we have many sorrows, many troubles, much suffering here in this life. But our suffering will all come to an end. And we will then have joy and glory that will last forever. And just as God used Christ's sufferings for good, right, used his sufferings to win salvation for us and turned the apparent defeat of the cross into the wonderful victory of Easter, so he uses even our sufferings for our good to make us more like Jesus Christ. Right, he uses our sins to get us to trust more in his grace. He uses our hardships to get us to rely more on him and on his power so that our faith shines that much more brightly. And when he allows us to experience the painful and destructive consequences of our sins, it's only because he's disciplining us as his beloved children, because he wants us to see where our sin leads, that we'll say, oh, I don't want that, right? So that we would learn to shun evil in the same way that his son Jesus Christ does. And when we suffer for doing what is right in a world that is filled with wrong, God is winning honour for us by allowing us to follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. And what is more, not only does he use our sufferings for our good, but these sufferings are fleeting and are not worth comparing to the eternal glory that awaits us. Often we human beings, at least in this life, are very impatient, and we have very limited vision. And when we're in the middle of our sufferings, it feels like they're going to last forever, and we can't see an end in sight. 
but they do always come to an end. But our su su sorrows are always fleeting because life in this world is brief. And when it is over and we enter into God's kingdom and we see his glory and we see how wonderful all the things he's prepared for us really are and we see the immensity of eternity, then we'll realise just how brief and insignificant all of our troubles really were. Our text for today compares the experience of the Christian life with the experience of a woman as she goes through labour. Now, when she's in the middle of her labour, she experiences intense pain. But what then happens? Her pain comes to an end and is replaced by that wonderful joy of holding her newborn baby in her arms. In the same way, as Christians in this world, yes, we experience pain, sometimes intense pain. Uh, but this is all quickly coming to an end and is going to be replaced by the joy that God has prepared for us that will have no end. Yes, now we live in a world in which everything is broken and dying. And us and all the creatures around us are groaning because of the sin that we experience and because of how everything in our world is subject to this bondage to corruption and decay, right? So that everything is falling apart. Now, I know this certainly breaks my heart and I think it probably breaks your heart too to see those things and those people that you love falling apart and slipping away. But all of this is temporary. Because God is at work to give birth to a whole new world where there's without sin and without, without sickness and with, without corruption or decay or suffering or death in which everything will be beautiful and joyful and good and which will last forever. And what God is making us as his people to be is soon going to be revealed. The book of 2 Corinthians compares us Christians to clay jars that are hiding a glorious treasure. Right? If you look at a clay jar, it doesn't matter how glorious the treasure inside it is, all you're going to see is the clay jar and not the treasure. Well, that's what we are like. Right? God is making us to be glorious and new. And already this work of his spirit is going on inside us. And yet this work of the spirit is hidden underneath the clay. Right? It's hidden underneath our flawed and failing bodies that haven't yet experienced the resurrection of the body on the last day. And it's hidden underneath all of our sins and failings. But soon all of this is going to be stripped away and the work of God is going to be revealed. And on that day, we are going to say, wow. But one day I'm going to see all of you guys in heaven, all of you who are in Christ Jesus. And on that day, I'm going to be like, wow, Bruce. Wow, Marlene. You know, wow, Alan. You know, wow, whoever. <laughs> wow, Ruth. Wow, Barry, wow, Linda, right, wow, Naomi, I didn't know that you were so amazing and wonderful, right, my eyes didn't have the ability to penetrate the clay to really see what God is doing, but now it's been revealed, and isn't the work of God marvellous? Where if God tells us that's true, wouldn't it be great if our eyes of faith would actually live out that reality? every day as we recognize that in the people of God around us, God is working something that's wonderful and glorious and good. All right, so our sins cannot separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus, and our sufferings cannot separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And the Holy Spirit then wraps all of this up by saying that nothing in all creation, not tribulation, not distress, not persecution, not famine, or nakedness, or danger, or the sword, or death, or life, or angels, or demons, or things present, or things future, 
or earthly powers and authorities, or height, or depth, or COVID-19, or draconian lockdown measures, or whatever. Right, nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Because God is for us, and therefore nothing can stand against us. Right, God is almighty. Right, nothing can hinder his power. And so when he is determined that he is going to bless us, well then, nothing and no one can take this blessing away. And God has proven that he is for us and that he loves us by sending us his son. As our text for today says, if God did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, right, while we were still dirty, rotten sinners, because he wanted to reconcile us to himself, right, do you think he's going to turn his backs on us now that we are his beloved children? Right? Absolutely not. But instead he is going to graciously give us all good things. And because God is for us, he now sends his son and his spirit to be with us and to minister to us and to intercede for us in all our needs. But do you know that the Holy Spirit who is in you and who reads your heart and who knows you better than you know yourself is continually praying for you? Right? That's what our text for today says. So in the worst moments of your, your life, when you are feeling really down, Maybe you're so distressed that you can't even put your distress into words and voice a prayer to God. Well, at those moments, the Holy Spirit who searches your heart is praying for you with groans too deep for words. And these prayers ascend before the throne of God in heaven. And in the same way, the Lord Jesus Christ is praying for you too. I think one of the most beautiful passages in the Bible comes towards the end of Luke's gospel, at Luke's account of the Last Supper, where Jesus tells his disciples that they're all going to fall away, including Peter, who was going to deny him three times that very night. But then what does he say to Peter? He says, Simon, Simon, that Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat. Right? But don't worry, Peter, right? Because I've prayed for you so that your faith would not fail. And when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. Right? I think that's so beautiful, right? Jesus knew that Peter was going to fail him in his hour of need, that he was going to deny that he even knew him to save his own skin. But when Peter was being so faithless, what was his Lord Jesus Christ doing? Being absolutely faithful. And he's busy praying for Peter that his faith would not fail. And his faith didn't fail. Yes, it was pretty weak and wavering. But he did turn back. And he ended up becoming a great pillar in God's church who strengthened his brothers. And likewise, the Lord Jesus Christ is praying for you. Right, that your faith would not fail. And that you would be a great pillar in his kingdom. And do you think that Almighty God is going to fail to heed the, the prayers of his son and of his spirit? No, absolutely not. So when we have a God who is for us in this way, there is really only one sane response. And that is to cast off all fear and to rejoice that this almighty God who holds our lives in his hands and controls our future is really fond of you. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.